lights on. Um, Kyle and his family are out of town this morning. Uh, that, that's the reason I'm speaking to you this morning. And tonight, Randy will be bringing a lesson for us as well. And then I think Kyle and, and Jess and Navy are due back, I think, on Tuesday. I'm not absolutely sure of that. But uh, uh, a few months ago, we, we finished our Wednesday night adult class. Is that a little loud? It sounds like it may not, not bad. OK. We finished our Wednesday night Bible study on on Romans, and some of you will remember our discussion in Romans chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2. Um, there's a lot there. there that, is, that could be a study unto itself for, a, for a, good, a good long time. And I don't propose to you that I'm going to cover all of that in, in 30 or 40 minutes here. But there is a portion of that passage that I would like to you know, to consider for us to think about this morning. And even that part of it, the will of God, don't expect that I'm going to cover everything in, in one lesson this morning. That is a huge, huge uh, concept, idea. And uh, it can be looked at in a number of ways. And uh, I'm, I'm only going to consider one, you know, one portion of that this morning. Let's read that again, if you don't mind. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Um, generally speaking, uh, you'll, you'll hear most uh, consider two ideas about the will of God. And one is thought of as that sovereign rule of God, that plan that he has put in place uh, from the time of creation even until today that uh, has been steadfast and unchanged. His will is sovereign in the sense that uh, you can choose to reject it or not, but it's not going to change. This is the will that Jesus spoke of in the garden leading up to his crucifixion. He prayed, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. And that's the sovereign nature of, of God's will that, that you know, is one, one idea, one uh, thought. Um, another part of God's will is, is considered that, that will of command. Uh, and, and those are more specific in nature, but frankly, some of them are still general in nature as well. But those are the commands that we'll physically read about here in, in the scriptures. Now, uh, when I mean general, when I say general in nature, what I mean by that is the greatest commandment is to love God and then love our neighbor as ourselves. But, but the scriptures don't go into the very detailed specifics of exactly how we do that under different circumstances. And that's gonna be different for all of us, depending on where the situations we find ourselves in, depending on what we are in this life, uh, you know, husband, wife, a child, uh, employee, wherever our lot is in this life, that, that's where we will demonstrate these commands that are a little more general in nature. What I want us to consider for a few minutes this morning is that criteria surrounding those specific wills, those specific occurrences in our lives that we should be carrying out to fulfill God's ultimate will. And by no means is this exhaustive, um, uh, but uh, just in the few minutes we have, I'll offer up uh, several uh, scriptures and, and some commentary on those scriptures. But what I'd ask of you is that you relate these to that will of God that we're talking about, that will of command that we carry out by the way that we live those things that he desires, those things that he wants, those things that he wills, if you will, in our lives. You might want to think of this as an attitudinal will of God. These, these are the things that we should take into consideration when we go out into the world and live the kind of life we're supposed to live as his children. 
And so try to think of it in that regard, if you would. And I'm not going to show you anything new. These scriptures that we'll look at, you've all seen over time. And, and uh, so don't, don't expect any earth-shattering uh, disclosures here. But, but please try to relate them in the context of, of uh, Romans uh, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The, the first thing I want us to consider, turn over to John chapter 6, if you would. John chapter 6, let's read verses 39 and 40. John chapter 6, verses 39 and 40. And of course, this is Jesus speaking. And um, picking up in verse 39, Jesus said, And this is the will of him who sent me that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him may have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on that last day. What Jesus is saying here is that it's God's will that every single person be saved. He wants everyone to be Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, was sacrificed for every single person that ever lived or ever will live. And it's God's will, it's his desire that everyone be saved. You and me have a distinct advantage over the non-believer. We have the word of God. We've got Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We confess that, we believe that. Our faith and our hope is in that. Others don't have that. What a wonderful blessing that is. Now, in that salvation, in that condition of being saved, God expects to be glorified. His will is that he be glorified by saving us. We should live our lives in a way that glorifies our God. In Matthew, Jesus spoke to this in a in the Sermon on the Mount. Once again, these are, these are passages everyone will recognize. Um, in the Sermon on the Mount, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Do not, nor do men light a lamp and put it under a peck measure, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Your salvation demands good works. And not for your benefit, but to the glory of God. That's what he expects. That's what he paid for when he gave his son. He, his will is that he be glorified in us. Now, this idea of being saved, um, boy, what a... What an underemphasized uh, idea that is. We, we equate, most of us equate being saved with just being baptized. Boom, you're baptized and you're saved. There's a, there's a built-in divine commandment in our salvation. And that built-in divine commandment is that we convert others. That we live our lives in a way that others will seek Jesus Christ and seek the salvation that we enjoy. In, um, in John chapter 20, John chapter 20, Jesus emphasizes this. In John chapter 20 and verse 21, he told the disciples, Jesus therefore said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. That's as relevant today as it was back then when Jesus physically said that to his disciples. And in our salvation, we should be living our lives in a way. I'm not talking, no, everybody's not cut out to be a preacher or an evangelist or a teacher or a missionary, whatever. Everybody's not cut out for that. We understand that. But nobody has the excuse for not living their lives in such a way that, they, that non-believers cannot see Jesus Christ. That's, that's, the, that's what he's saying here. That's what he said in verse 1 of Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. That's what, our life, that's what our sacrifice is. That's what our living sacrifice and service of worship is. Our, our everyday lives that are incorporating the will of God and showing others the way. 
that light that Jesus talked about back in Matthew chapter 5. So that's first and foremost in, God's, in understanding God's will is that we be in a saved condition. If, if we don't have that, just, just write it all off. Nothing else matters. If we're not in that relationship with our God, nothing else matters. So that's first and foremost in God's word is uh, God's will is, is getting right with him is getting into that relationship of salvation that he offers to us. Second thing, this one, well, this one could take on a, a, a whole life of itself as well. To understand the will of God, we have got to be spirit-filled and word-filled. Now, I, I, I understand, I think all of us are on the same page on the word-filled. I mean, that's easy. That's, that's the word of God. We get into the Word of God and, and recognize that understanding and knowing it, the knowledge associated with that will get us closer to God, will, will help us to, to, uh, to live our lives in a way that, that will understand the, His will for us. But being spirit-filled is a little different. That's, that's a little um, spirit. Well, I can't see that. I can't touch it. I can't smell it. Spirit takes on a different meaning for all of us. And we need to understand that first and foremost, we are spiritual beings. All this other, this stuff, it's, it's going to be gone. It's just a matter of time. That's all it is. Just a matter of time. It's the spirit within us that is going to live eternally. And we need to learn to yield our spirit to that of God's, the Holy Spirit. We've got to let his spirit fill us. Turn over to Ephesians 5, if you would. Ephesians chapter 5. And these are going to be very common verses, but sometimes we don't look at these verses in the same regard uh, as we're looking at them now. But uh, in, in Ephesians uh, chapter 5, let's pick up in verse uh, 15. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15. Paul said, therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Now, now 17 and 18 here, he says, so then do not be foolish. Now, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And then the next verse, see what he says? And do not get drunk with wine. Don't be stupid. Don't be foolish. Do not get drunk. That's foolishness. That's ignorance. And then but he says, go ahead in, in verse four, uh, 17, but understand what the will of God. Then in 18 he says, but be filled with the Spirit. That's wisdom. That's the wisdom of God, is allowing his Spirit to dwell in us. You know, turn over to this. Now, like I said, oftentimes we look at this passage talking about uh, instrumental music and making melody in our hearts and those things. Turn over to uh, it, the sister passage, Colossians. Turn over to Colossians chapter 3. And let's pick up, uh, well, just, we'll just read verse 16. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankful, thankfulness in our hearts to God. Those, those two passages are obviously very parallel. One emphasizes being filled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the second one being filled with the Word of God, the Gospel of Christ. Those are not the same thing. They are extremely related, and they are parallel to each other. You can't have one without the other, I don't think. So don't, and, and that's, sometimes that's where we, I'm afraid that's, that's, that's where we may lose our, our grip on that. Is, is that we don't give the, the Spirit of God the credit that it deserves in our lives. The Spirit of God is working as much today as it was back in the time of Jesus Christ when it was helping perform miracles. It's just working in a different way because we don't need the miracles now. We, we've got the Word of God. But we still need the Spirit of God. We still need the Holy Spirit. And we need to realize that that's what we are, is Spirit and that we need to yield our spirit to the Holy Spirit. That's, to understand the will of God, we need to be spirit-filled, 
And we need to spend time in God's Word. There's no substitute for that. I mean, you can, you can sit here every Sunday and Wednesday and uh, uh, for the rest of your life. Frankly, that's not going to be enough. You're going to have to get into the Word of God on your own. Ponder it and meditate upon it on your own. Not listen to someone's discourse. But, but get it somehow incorporate in your daily lives spending time in God's Word. I know that's, you know, it's not the easiest thing to do. We've got demands on our time. I understand that. Uh, but teach a class or something. Have a Bible study with someone. Uh, there, there are numerous Bible studies that are going on around us uh, all, all week long. Get, get involved in them. That'll get you into the word, of, the word of God, the gospel of Christ. And allow, it, allow the Spirit to put those things that you learn in the Word of God, that knowledge that you learn from the Word of God, let the Spirit put those things to work for you. It'll help you understand the will of God that's talked about in Romans chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 12. Um, the third thing I want us to consider, this is, this is so sad. Turn over to 1 Thessalonians, if you would. 1 Thessalonians. Chapter, uh, chapter 4, First, First Thessalonians chapter 4. Let me, let me propose to you that to understand the, word of, the will of God, we have to be in pursuit of purity. We talked a little bit about the church being pure and um, not wrinkled and, and no spot. And, and that's depend we are the church. That's dependent on us. We need to pursue purity in our lives. In 1 Thessalonians, and, and this, is, boy, this is hard in our world today. This is, this is hard. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, let's pick up in verse 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor not in lust, lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man transgress, transgress and defraud his brother in the matter because the Lord is the avenger of all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. This sexual immorality, I, uh, um, and I, I suggest to you it's not just sexual immorality, it's all immorality over in... Um, Second, you don't have to turn over there to this. Over in Second John chapter one, um, or Second Peter chapter one, Peter wrote, "Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence." We've got to pursue morality. Sexual morality is 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 seems to be the the big one of the day, but there's also those other moral things that we've got to have incorporated in our lives. All those physical things like not lying and not cheating and not stealing and, and uh, just all those things uh, are, are, are incorporated in such a way that we've got to live those things in order to understand the will of God for us. But sexual immorality is especially pointed out there in First Thessalonians. Um, several months ago, I, I got a call from a, a young man and uh, he, he asked, and, and I've known him over the, over the years, uh, and he asked if we could meet for a few minutes. And uh, I had no idea what it was, what it was about. And, uh, and, and of course, you know, I said, yes, of course, I'll sit down with you. And so we arranged a, a time for us to sit down and meet. And uh, he's, he's married and has one or two children. I know he has one child. But he told me, he, he said, Paul, I've, I've I've got an addiction to porn. I'm on the internet all the time. I'm, I'm addicted to it. And uh, you, you, you want to destroy your life, especially if, 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 you, if you've got a spouse there who trusts you and who honors you. You, you want to ruin your life. You get involved in that stuff. And don't, don't think for a minute it's not addictive. Porn will do to your mind and your heart the same thing alcohol will do to your blood, your body. 
It will pollute it and it will ruin it. There's no place for that sort of, there's no place for any immaturity, uh, impurity, especially sexual immorality. There's, there's no way that can exist and we fully understand the will of God for us. Listen, that is dangerous. Now this, this young man, he, 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 he was pretty, pretty uh, open. He confessed it and he said, you know, Paul, I got away with it for so long. Then my wife found out and I promised her, I won't do this again. Uh, he, he, he promised and he did it again. She found out again. Look at what was lost because of that sexual immorality. The trust that she placed in him and in their relationship. What else was going on? I can see how she might question that. What, what else is going on in your life that I'm not aware of? I mean, this guy, he, and he was beat up. He was heartbroken. But that's what an addiction is. It consumes you. And, and frankly, there are, there are very few ways to get out of those situations. This is the big one. And I, I, I think that's part of the reason he called me. He wanted input from this perspective. And it wasn't a question whether or not he knew what was right or wrong. That's not the point here. He, he, he needs a lot, of, and he was getting help. He, he had sought out, he was seeking out counseling and, uh, for him and his wife, and, and, uh, but just all the devastation to one's life because of sexual immorality. But the main thing I'm trying to make you understand here is that we can't understand the will of God for us if we're polluted like that. If our minds and our hearts are polluted like that. Um, Proverbs chapter 4, I believe. This is not a, this is kindly. Proverbs chapter 4, and you guys know this. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put devious lips far from you. Let your eyes look directly ahead and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. Watch the path of your feet and all your ways will be established. We'd better be diligent about what goes into our hearts and our minds because if we're not, Satan is going to figure his way in there. You can count on it. You can count on it. The writer here in Proverbs, Solomon, watch over your heart with all diligence. He says, be careful of what you say, be careful of what you see, and be careful of what you seek after in life. Because if it's not godliness, they're, they're going to have more, more problems than you ever figured. Keep your hearts and your minds pure. That's the message here, especially from sexual uh, immoralities. Um, this fourth one, we, we, have to, we have to be thankful to God before we can fully understand his will. And I want us to go back to Ephesians and Colossians. In Ephesians 5 again, um, if, you'll, if you'll turn over there, I, I want to look at one other passage back in 1 Thessalonians 5. And of course, this is, you don't have to turn to that, but in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 18, in everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, look in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 5 again, and go, go back to uh, verses 18. And let's, let's read, let's read those again. Uh, verses 18 through 20 this time. Now, now he's just, keep in mind, Paul has just written and told him, he said, fill your hearts with the Holy Spirit. Demonstrate wisdom in God and fill your hearts with the Holy Spirit. Don't be foolish and stupid and get drunk with dissipation and excess. And then let's pick up in verse 18 here and we'll read through verse 20. And do not uh, get drunk with wine for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. 
speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody with your hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. Well, let's go over to that sister passage we talked about also in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, and let's pick up in verse, uh, well, let's go to verse 15. Verse 15 of Colossians chapter 3. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. We, we, need to, we need to be thankful. I, I, was, um, I was trying to uh, relate, and, and I just didn't, because this, this was a, a thought I'd just read. In, in my understanding, thankfulness, tr true thankfulness demands humility. If, 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 you're, if you're truly thankful for something or to somebody, I, I'm not. I'm not sure how you can express that without being humble. Um, to, to me, those are, are sort of kissing cousins. We've got to have a thankful heart to God in order to understand His will for us, for what what He paid for our salvation. We, we need to live a thankful life. And, and, and like I said. That is, that is going to demand that we be humble. If we're not, if we're not humble, we're not, not, we're not going to understand the will of God. We need, we need to be humble, and we need, and we need to be thankful to our God. To our God. Let's, 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 let's look at, uh, um, let's look at let's one, one more. more. Um, um, uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not... not this, this is... This is um, in, in first, in first, in first, first Peter... First Peter. And that, this, and that this shouldn't be an easy one, one. But, frankly, but frankly, it's, it's, it's I mean, I think, I mean, I think my children, children, my children, my children, 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 uh, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I've never, never seen a salt, salt on Christianity. On Christianity but I've, I've seen just in the last few years. And, and, uh, and uh, so, so what? What I? What I? That, 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 in in first, Peter, first Peter, chapter two. Chapter two. Let's let's pick up in verse thirteen. First Peter, first chapter two, two and verse thirteen. Verse Submit verse yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evil doers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Well, that's getting harder and harder to do to silence the ignorance. Of, to silence the, the ignorant men. Uh, I, I just recently uh, read, just, just in, in the past week, um, of a doctor, and, and he, he, he was in, he's in Georgia, came from California. He was a, direct, a health department director in California. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, he, he, had, he had been that, in that position in California, then he relocated to Georgia, and was also a, a health department director. Now I think most, uh, the, probably the lowest level of those, of, of the health departments are probably the county, I'm thinking. <laughs> and, and I can't remember, I don't know if he was some sort of district level or even state level de director of a health department. But he was also a minister. I, I, I think Seventh Day Adventist. If, it, if the article said what it was, I think it said Seventh Day. Don't quote me on that part of it. Um, but he preached against homosexuality and those sexual immoralities that we just talked about. He preached against that in a public manner. 
in, in, his, uh, in a sermon lesson. His superiors got wind of that and fired him for that. They fired him for that. Now, I, I, I don't know all the legal stuff that's going on. I, I, I think he's probably suing them, obviously. I mean, it's a direct violation of our Constitution, but who cares? Anymore, who cares? In this world today, they don't care. They just don't. This doesn't mean anything to the world. That's why it's so important that we understand what God's will is and that we understand the criteria that we look at to understand it and incorporate it into our lives. Don't underestimate this. Who would have ever dreamed of that very situation there just 20 or 30 years ago? Who would have ever, well, I could go on and on. My generation, you know, when I was a kid, uh, I mean, homosexuality was just unheard of. It was such a shameful thing to be associated with. I mean, even divorce, even divorce. There was a time when that was just utterly dis just disgusting to people. But today, it's, those things are just nothing. They're, they're nothing, except to us Christians, those that are in a relationship with God, those that are trying to understand the will of God for them in their lives, that their lives can be a, a sacrifice and a living service to God that others can see God through the way that we conduct ourselves in the pursuit of his will. So those are just some things. Like I said, that's not exhausted by any manner. Uh, they, you know, we, we could probably add to that list. Uh, uh, I even have a couple of more here, but it's about time to, to uh, wrap it up. And um, I hope your expectations weren't too high this morning. Uh, with Kyle being gone, and, and, uh, uh, but he'll be back uh, uh, by midweek, and um, I do appreciate the kind attention on everybody's part. And let's just, let's don't think of God's will as just, well, yeah, I heard that yesterday, but today's Monday. Uh, I'll, th I'll think about it the next time I go to church. Let's don't do that. Let's incorporate this in our lives every day. That's our service to him. That's how we reach others. You know, you may not even say a word to somebody, but the way you conduct yourself may speak volumes to them. So let's don't forget that. Let's try to live God's will. First, we understand it, and then try to live his will every day of our lives. Anytime we're together like this, we offer the opportunity to anyone who... Um, uh, might be considering obeying the gospel. We want to make that opportunity available to anyone that's ready to make that commitment in Christ. And we stand ready to, to baptize. And um, so we want to offer an invitation to you for that. And if there's anyone who, uh, if there's anyone who has stumbled and fallen that needs the prayers of their brothers and sisters, we, we want to do that as well. We want to encourage each other in any way that we can. So if you have any need, we want to invite you to come forward now as we stand and sing the song of invitation.